Public Transit with RoboHub, the podcast for news and views on robotics. Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we'll be hearing about ride-sharing algorithms and a startup whose mission is to use optimization to change the future of public transportation. The Routing Company, a startup born from work in MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, is commercializing a software solution to public transit's limited reach and inefficiency. They partner with cities to augment their existing public transportation infrastructure with a fleet of on-demand buses and the technology to route them optimally. Unlike other ride-sharing apps, these high-capacity vehicles are priced like city buses and they're intended to provide an alternative in areas where demand exceeds supply, so-called transit deserts. Our interviewer Lily spoke to Alex Waller, co-founder and CTO of The Routing Company, to find out more about their innovative solution to boost public transportation. Hi, welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, my name is Alex Waller. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and uh, the CTO of The Routing Company. Okay, cool. Now, before we uh, get into talking about The Routing Company, would you mind telling us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so I'm a computer scientist. I I studied computer science at uh, the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where um, I became super interested in motion planning and and, and multi-agent, like uh, path planning. Uh, and that type of interaction and uh, optimization work was super interesting to me. Uh, and so I decided that it would be really cool to, to try and do a PhD and, and pursue that, that research further. So um, I got accepted into to MIT to do a PhD in computer science with a focus on robotics. And I, I worked on, you know, a few robotics projects that were, were pretty interesting. We were we had just at that point started the autonomous car project at the uh, computer science and AI lab uh, at MIT. Um, so it was nice to be a part of that. But while I was there, um, I got um, became a part of a project um, that was focused on mobility and transportation, and that really really piqued my interest. It was it was like one of our postdocs in the lab, one of his uh, one of his side projects that he was working on, um, and I re- got really drawn into this type of optimization that was so hard to solve, um, but affects or can affect so many people, and that really got me interested in in working on transportation. But the interesting connection with robotics, uh, for instance, is robotics is all about solving really big intractable problems in real time. You know, you want to, everything has to be 30 hertz at least, right? And it was kind of cool to see, you know, all the cool shortcuts and, and heuristics um, that we've done in robotics for optimization uh, to be, you know, applied over into transportation and mobility. Awesome. So the, the, the routing company is uh, a transportation company. Can you tell us a little bit about what its goal is? Yeah. Um, so we partner with cities to power the future of public transportation. And so uh, we believe that a community of, of any size with any resources anywhere in the world should be able to meet the transportation needs of its people. Uh, and so we took some uh, this technology that we had been developing at MIT um, that was uh, used to um, route high capacity vehicles uh, on demand in, in real time. And we wanted to do it to optimality, really trying to solve the hardest of mobility challenges. Uh, we ended up publishing a paper that showed we could service all of Manhattan's taxi demand, uh, but with 80% fewer vehicles by having the passengers share rides. And all of this is being solved in real time and at like city scale levels of demand. And so our company really started on on how can we get this technology um, out into the world? How can we have governments start using this type of on-demand routing technology? And um, and that was really like the, the base of, of our business. Um, and so now we offer a rider app, a driver app, uh, a fleet management dashboard that uh, cities can use to launch and manage these uh, on-demand modes of transportation. So you started working in sort of a rideshare context, and you've now transitioned to working with cities as well. Does the technology change significantly there? No, that's the really interesting part. It was it was it's so uh, interesting to uh, try to commercialize like academic technology. Right, because it's not necessarily you're coming into a market that has a known problem uh, that you're going to apply technology to. You're really coming in with some technology, and you and you know in your heart of hearts that there is a real value add to society with this technology. And starting the business the first year was all about finding where does that fit. 
And we didn't end up really fitting with ride sharing. You know, they have their own set of constraints um, and they want to have a lot of ownership in, um, you know, in their marketplace and in their dispatch systems. But what we saw, there was a huge pain point in public transportation and really the, um, the reach of fixed lines like buses or trains and then how they penetrate in cities and how they really haven't been doing the job that they've needed to do to really meet the transportation needs in a lot of cities. There's a lot of transit deserts out there. So are you, as part of what you are doing, um, like proposing solutions to that sort of thing, like extending those um, fixed lines? So uh, right now, um, what we'll typically do is uh, we'll work closely with the city uh, to launch our rider side brand called Pingo. So Pingo is like our app name that you can see in, um, in the app stores. Uh, so riders, you know, um, anywhere can download this Pingo app. And what we do is onboard the transit agency into our app. Um, and then they can download the driver app as well um, for their bus drivers. And then that means that they can have a totally fluid, on-demand, Uber-like experience, but that is within the realm of public transportation. So you can imagine, you know, booking a bus on your phone uh, to go to the airport instead of, you know, taking, you know, here the silver line um, to the airport. That'd be the idea. And so when you book the bus, does that actually change the bus's scheduled route? Okay. Yep. Yeah, the buses have no fixed routes or schedules. They are totally on, uh, they're totally on demand and uh, dynamic. Uh, and what we're working on now is actually connecting these buses into transit so that while you're on the app, uh, you could actually go and select um, what transit hub you want to to get to. And then we can use the departures of that transit hub. For instance, like let's say it's a train that's leaving a train station. We can use the expected departure time of that train to help constrain um, our model such that you get to the train on time. And so these are the, the transit extension that we're working on now. What we originally worked on was, you know, just a minimal viable product. How do we, you know, route cars that can pick up 10 people how do we wrap them totally on demand and have a good experience for the driver, which is very important, uh, and as well for the rider. And there's usually somebody like a dispatcher sitting behind a desk who is monitoring these buses and taking call center requests, you know, when people call in. Um, and we had to build the whole product out for, for that user as well. So it's really like if I if, if imagine packaging a lot of Uber's product and technology in a way that made it extremely accessible uh, to public transportation. And so your 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 Pingo buses exist not on fixed schedules, um, but are separate from, say, the public transit buses, which are available in that city. Yeah, so they have um, typically, uh, particularly uh, specially trained drivers um, who've gone through our driver training, who understand how to use the driver app. Um, and they uh, they drive around, and when they get a request, um, then it, it automatically routes them to that pickup um, and then to that drop-off as well. Uh, and so it's totally on demand. But what's cool is that while you uh, while that driver is picking somebody else up, there might be somebody else added into that schedule. So they might pick two people up or three people up. Um, in one of our launches in Andorra, um, where we're seeing uh, quite a lot of success right now, we had a 15-seater bus filled to capacity, which means that we're really like able to you know, suck out all of the the efficiency we possibly can from their transit network there. So that sort of collective optimization where you're using, getting as many people per bus, does that detract from a per user optimization of I'm getting there as fast as possible? Is that a trade-off? That's a really, really, really good question. And so we've thought a lot about this. And it's actually the base of our technology. We have two constraints that we use when determining, you know, which pickup drop-off sequences are viable. And that's the max waiting time, which is like how long we're, we're, we will allow a rider to wait to get picked up. And then the max delay time. And that delay time is how, how much are we willing to have a rider go out of their way to share with other people? And these are, are, you know, pretty rigid constraints in our system that um, that the transit agency can set through our dashboard. Um, but they, you know, bound that level of inconvenience that the riders will experience. And um, so, what I think is, sure, we we sacrifice. Like, it's always the best thing for a rider to have a bus come immediately to them, pick them up, and immediately then drop them off. But we would, under that model, you wouldn't be able to 
to um, to satisfy the levels of demand that a city would would have um, under like the resource constraints that they have for buses, for instance. Like when you only have four buses to serve, you know, um, to serve like thirty thousand people, right? You need to be using those buses extremely effectively. So you know, fifteen people at a time instead of one person at a time. So you mentioned that it's the transit agency that can set those constraints. And I think I'm, I'm still a little unclear on how it is that you interface with the transit agency. Are they your customer and they control the Pingo buses as well as the normal city level transportation? Yeah, yeah. What we think is, you know, we are experts at um, technology and product and the transit agency is really expert at asset management and operations. And so we give them all the tools they need to be able to to operate the, this on demand this on demand system as a you know another tool in their toolbox, right? They also use other so- other software like Trapeze, uh, for instance, to manage their their fixed routed buses. And so this is just you know the software that manages their on demand buses. Um, yeah, so they the the trans agency is really our, our our customer. We we sell we sell to them. Um, and we have a pretty, you know, um, a, a fixed cost per bus that that we that we charge the transit agency to make it extremely simple, um, and um, and and yeah, and we help them as well with an operations playbook to make sure that you know they're not left to to hear some product to make it work. Like we're there helping them as as well to make sure it's successful. So then, as an individual sort of using this app to call one of these buses, are you? Uh, paying normal public transit rates, or is it closer to normal Uber rates? So the rates can be totally set by the trans- transit agency. We give them all the flexibility to to manage it them, themselves. And um, this is, you know, one of the reasons why we work with public transportation instead of instead of doing our own rideshare system, is because you know the unit economics of a bus are, are not very good. Right, buses lose a lot of money, but they're extremely essential uh, to moving people around and. And improving um, our economy, and you know, in particular, I believe that for every dollar uh, spent on public transportation infrastructure, we receive five dollars back in GDP growth. So it's like extremely important to give people an affordable, uh, publicly managed way um, of being able to get to work and be able to spend money somewhere and to get home. Right? It's a makes the economy. It literally moves the economy. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I work with transit agencies. And yeah, the prices are typically um, far lower than what you would see in, you know, for in, for an Uber, for instance. Um, in Andorra, uh, I believe the prices are are, are two or, or one euro, I believe. Um, and the prices in um, in Bainbridge Island, I believe, are like two dollars. So they they they're in line with how much it costs to ride a bus. So uh, two sort of follow up questions. Uh, with this affordability in mind, is there is there much money in like how does your company profit? And then are there sort of competitive companies doing similar things, or sort of are you the only ones in this domain right now? It's a really good question. Um, and so yeah, we we heavily rely on the subsidized nature of public transportation. Essentially, uh, the government is willing to take a loss on public transportation for you know the the outsized um, you know benefit that buses have and and the public transportation has on society, uh, and so they're they're willing to pay more than you know what they recoup in in fares. I think right now buses in the United States have about a twenty five percent. Uh, fare box recovery. So they only make back 25% of their costs um, that they actually spent on, on uh, you know, making the bus operate. And so our sell to them is that we can, first of all, make the buses more efficient so that they're moving more people around more in more flexibly, in, in more flexible manner. And we improve the rider experience because, you know, a lot of times we're offering people transportation in places where they didn't have it before at all. Uh, and even if they did have it before, it was usually an older system that required a call center that really wasn't made for the 21st century. And we also improve the lives um, or the work lives of the drivers and the transit operators because we put a lot of care in putting them as our customer and uh, understanding from their perspective what they need to be successful. Like as a transit operator looking at a map with buses, on the screen and, and picking people up, like we really thought about what information they need, what tools they need, and what interactions need to be implemented 
uh, for them to manage the transit uh, the transit system with you know with with, with minimal inconvenience. And for competitors, um, yeah. So there's Via. Via is a, a, a pretty big competitor of, of ours. Um, so Via started off with um, doing a shared rides uh, system, rideshare system in uh, Manhattan, and has since expanded and provide tools for public transportation, uh, public transportation agencies to to offer these on-demand modes of transportation as well. But I think that we are uniquely positioned in, uh, you know, that, the fact that we have one app. Um, so there's not multiple apps that you would download for different trans agencies. It's just one Pingo app that you can onboard different trans agencies to. And plus, I, we we truly believe our technology in, in how we solve these you know incredibly intractable optimization problems is truly world class. Yeah. So I do want to ask more about how you solve those optimization problems. But first, um, you mentioned that your Andorra uh, deployment is going well. How long has the company been in existence and where do you have other deployments also? We founded, my, my co-founder and I founded uh, the routing company and then called Routable AI um, in uh, like officially May 2019. That's when, that's when I quit my PhD and that's when my, my co-founder quit his job and moved to the States. Um, and so, yeah, we started in May 2019 and trying to you know find our way and we really landed on... Um, we, we really landed on we need to build an app and we need to integrate with public transportation by, you know, July of 2020, maybe June of 2020. Um, we have a deployment in Bainbridge Island um, in uh, off the co- uh, like west of Seattle, um, operating their on-demand bus system uh, uh, in Andorra in, in a town called um, Escaldas. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big city in Andorra, just uh, on the border between Spain and France. Uh, that use it is basically the public transportation that exists there is now Pingo as our app, which is kind of amazing. Um, and we also have a deployment. We have two deployments in Scotland where we have a more rural setting that we um, are able to accommodate. Excuse me. And um, we have a pause deployment right now in, uh, in Australia. Uh, they paused because of lockdowns that they've been having in Melbourne. Yeah, I was going to ask how you think that um, sort of coming about at a time when there's been a lot of uh, sort of fear associated with taking public transit and like rideshare companies have gotten rid of their pool options and that sort of thing. How does that sort of change what your original vision was? I think we actually didn't, didn't stray too, too far from it. We knew that COVID would, would uh, pass um, and we, we did have conviction about um, our technology and, and product direction. We did think about different pivots and what we could, what else we could do with optimization and our technology. But, but you know, by the time that a lot of the media uh, was coming out with, um, you know, infrastructure more, you know, tentative increase spending on infrastructure for public transportation, um, along with uh, a lot of these uh, trans agencies needing to cut their their fixed transit lines because they're just they're no longer running at capacity and therefore costing them too much it actually became kind of a tailwind for for us because there's just more people sorry yeah more people in power having less money and are facing bigger problems and and so at that point it's like okay we gotta you know continue on this the shared ride system even though we're in a pandemic so can you talk a little bit more about um, the, the optimization strategy itself and sort of the biggest technical challenges? Yeah, it's really cool, um, which is like the, the heart of our technology is, is this uh, what we call our, our dispatcher and assigner uh, system. We call it DAS. Um, and uh, so we published the paper I mentioned in like uh, 2017. Um, and it outlines this really interesting way of solving the dial a ride problem, which essentially you have uh, some set of uh, pickup drop off requests, um, some set of vehicles, um, and some set of constraints on how you can service those requests. What is the uh, best allocation um, of vehicles to requests, and what schedule would they use to service those requests? Right, is really the problem. Um, and it's, this has been traditionally solved in like operations research and, and in mathematics by formulating a, a very complicated, uh, large um, optimization problem. And then you throw it in like a linear optimization problem that you throw into a optimization solver like Garobi or CPLEX or LPSolve. And then you, you press enter and you wait for a result. 
Now, the problem with that is these types of solvers are really, really bad at doing any type of ordering or scheduling, right? Because you actually increase the number of variables you need to represent your optimization problem quadratically because you need to be having a, you need to have a transition variable, you know, to go pick up request one to, to then pick up request two. That's, that's one transition variable. So for all your requests, you have like, you know, a squared number of variables that you need to represent all of the transitions, which, you know, doesn't scale very well. It's a lot of decisions this optimization solver has to make. And so what we said is given the constraints that we want to satisfy, is it feasible for us to just try to explore the entire space of possible schedules? So basically given, so the way we decided to then solve the problem was to, given the state of the vehicles and the state of the pickup drop-off requests, is there a way that we can quickly determine all the different possible pickup drop-off sequences that are feasible given our constraints? And we found a really cool way to do that um, using uh, like a constraint satisfaction um, and some uh, heuristics. And after we find all the schedules that are viable, which that's really the hard part, we're able to, to, to formulate a much simpler optimization problem, which is simply to select some subset of the schedules that minimize a global cost function, right? And so that breakup of the two, the two problems, you know, the actual ordering and scheduling versus the assignment, you know, took us from, you know, we can, I can solve, um, let's say for a day in Manhattan, it's like 400,000 requests and with 3,000 vehicles. And I can solve that on my laptop. And, but uh, I assume that you're not looking at a day's worth at a time because you wouldn't, you don't have any future knowledge of the traffic demand when you're solving. Very right. Well, so we, we, we kind of, do for the future, but it's like an extension. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so how we solve this problem is we, we take uh, 30 seconds worth of data. So we have some requests come in for 30 seconds. We, we, we take those new requests. We take a look at where the vehicles are and what requests still have there to be satisfied, right? And then we solve a batch optimization problem at that 30 second mark. And we continue doing that. And requests leave the batch whenever they've been either drop off, dropped off or marked as not being able to be fulfilled. So to be marked as not being able to be fulfilled or you know, to be an unfulfilled request, it, it just means that we didn't find a schedule for that request um, in a certain amount of time. And then we mark that as unfulfilled. And that's you know, going to happen because of these rigid constraints we have on how long we're going to have passengers wait or be delayed. So for an unfulfilled request, like as a user, what happens? You get a notification on the app that, that we're not able to fulfill you due to um, high demand. And for the most part, we work with the transit agency to understand why that unfulfilled request occurred and to see if there is a operational solution, for instance, you know, changing that max weight or max delay constraint um, or you know, having the buses be positioned in a better area when they have no rides. Those are typically what we what we go to. Yeah, but yeah, we're also looking at ways that we can have, um, we, we, so we can don't have, so we can not have unfulfilled requests, so that all requests can be fulfilled. But it, it does make the problem a bit more difficult because the decisions that because people are sharing rides, there's like a lot of cascading effects on the efficiency of those rides when you start adding in requests that break those constraints. So. If you can explain it in sort of a, a simplified way, what are the heuristics you're most heavily leaning on to come up with the viable schedules? Yeah, so what we, what we outlined in the, in the paper um, is uh, this very cool idea of a shareability click. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. It's kind of, it's, it's really, really neat. So um, let's say, imagine I have a, a graph. So I have a network. And a node in that network is a request. So both it's pickup and drop off. It's like, it's the request is the node. And I also have nodes that are the vehicles, right? And I'll have an edge between a vehicle and a request in that network, right? Uh, if it's possible for that vehicle to service that request, you know, just by itself, right? And so there's an edge. So that's like they, that, that vehicle can satisfy that request. So like it has an edge. Uh, now, two requests will have a, an edge between them. They'll be linked. 
if it's possible to service those requests together with one vehicle. That same vehicle that has an edge connected or just any hypothetical vehicle? Okay. Any hypothetical vehicle. If any hypothetical vehicle can service, you know, two requests, there's an edge between them, right? In the in the best case. So now as I'm going through and trying to calculate my schedules, I start off by trying to calculate all my schedules of size one, right? And so to do that, I only need to look at the it's that the edges that exist between vehicles and requests. It would be silly for me to ever consider a request and a vehicle that don't have an edge between them. That'd be silly. Right now, when I do try to compute uh, schedules of two requests, it would be silly for me to look at at requests together that don't have an edge between them because there's impossible for them to be shared in the best case. And then it gets interesting when you get to three and above, because then you are utilizing the fact that there's a click, a fully connected subgraph in this network, as like if that if that click doesn't exist then I should never even consider that schedule as viable. So I can, go a bit, I can go a bit more into that. So if I have, let's say three requests and they don't all have edges to each other, that means that in the best case, it's impossible for them to all be shared together. And so I should never consider them. And so, so when you, you talk about like looking at schedules of size one and then size two and then size three, do you uh, explore that up until as many as you can within some like optimization running time timeout, or do you have a hard cutoff? We use a hard cutoff. Um, it's, it's typically um, related to the capacities of the vehicles that we're using, uh, but it actually can be higher than that because, for instance, a vehicle that, ha that can pick up four people, right? Let's say capacity for a vehicle. Um, it could still have a schedule that has 20 requests in it, but that schedule still only works with having two people in the or four people in the vehicle at once at a maximum, right? And so sometimes we do want to have longer chains of schedules uh, that we can compute because it gives the vehicle more certainty about where they need to go in the future. Yeah, I imagine it gets just very complicated when you start thinking about how two rides only overlap for half the time and then you could have more capacity in that vehicle at the start and end. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's extremely interesting, um, and that's like yeah, like you said. And if you were to take a look at this problem and solve it in a very greedy fashion, right? Like that's a pitfall that you would fall into. Uh, however, um, the way because we're solving this with a global cost function and we're considering all of the schedules, that means that we're considering the schedules of size one and size two, and size three, size four, all the way to size K. And we're considering all of them in our assignment. And so that means any schedule that we've generated along that, you know, that during that first phase of our optimization, we're considering for an assignment. And since we're solving that problem globally, we're able to take into consideration multiple options that that vehicle had, multiple options that the request had, and we try to minimize a global cost function to satisfy everybody. And the global cost, so you mentioned the constraints of max waiting time and max delay time. What is it that you're optimizing for? Again, these are really interesting, this really, really interesting questions. So um, what we want to do, right, is, is make sure that all of the requests are serviced. Like at the end of the day, the, the KPI, the key performance uh, indicator that, that we care about the most is, is what percentage of requests went fulfilled versus unfulfilled. Right now, we if you were to optimize that at each batch, you would actually have a much worse cost function than what we use right now. Um, and, and that's because if you were to fill all the vehicles, if you were to fill the vehicles up with passengers at a current batch, it means that they're not they don't have seats available in the future for more requests that would be coming in. Right. And so what we actually uh, try to minimize um, is the delay experienced by all the passengers. We try to you know, maximize the throughput of the vehicles. And by maximizing the throughput of the vehicles in a single batch, we're able to maximize the service rate over like the entire day. But we don't know that for sure. That's, that's the crazy part about this is that we don't know. It's such a chaotic system that we don't know that for sure. All I know is that my, my co-founder, uh, Menno, he did a, his thesis on different cost functions in our algorithm and found that no matter how hard that he tried to tune this, 
no matter you know, no matter what he was trying to optimize for, it came back that the simple delay cost function was like categorically the best. Like, yeah, it's like all the hand tuning is this was strange because it it brings up questions about reinforcement learning. Like, like sure, the delay is one feature, right, in a large vector of features that represent the positive and negatives of our cost of, of our of our assignment, right? We are heavily, you know, you know, a weight of one and a weight of zero for everything else. I mean, if you think about it for the delay, is there a way that we can learn over time what the weight should be for different, you know, let's say also minimizing the waiting time and the delay and maybe the occupancy and the service rate uh, in order to then maximize the service rate at the end of the day. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's still unknown. Um, I can also elaborate a little bit more there on another interesting thing. What we're solving is really something called a model predictive control um, problem, right? An MPC. Um, in that we are looking at the current state of the world, and then we are making decisions uh, to control actors in that world to execute things into the future, right? Now, what we should be doing is solving that batch and then predicting the future, you know, that model predictive part, right? predicting the future and new requests and then solving the batch in the future and the batch in the future and then the future to have a receding horizon, um, except to solve each batch is incredibly hard, right? So to actually solve multiple batches into some time horizon would be just totally infeasible. And so, you know, we're always looking at ways that we can, you know, get around that. So do you, do you assume for instance, like some distribution of where, how you expect rides to appear in the next 30 seconds? currently is that part of this okay. we want to right right now we don't we did publish a paper earlier um, that took into consideration um, a future expected demand and we considered them like faux requests so we we like we would throw them into our system as being actual requests but there would be a much lower penalty to not service them right and what that did was it caused the vehicles to be rebalanced uh, while they were picking up other passengers to areas of high demand where that demand would also be shareable with the passengers on board. And it was a very interesting way. So we would predict or we'd have a distribution of what we expect the demand to be in the near future, like now casting it. And we would sample from that distribution and use those sampled requests as a way to bias our system towards areas of high demand. Okay. I have one last like very technical question. What do you do uh, if someone cancels a ride or if there's like significant unforeseen traffic or that kind of thing. Yeah. So traffic, traffic is a big one. Um, and so we, we have to be using real time traffic updates to estimate, you know, when people can get picked up. And, you know, all we can say is that when an assignment is made, we're using the best, most up to date information that we can possibly get our hands on. But, you know, while you're driving to the, you know, taking your, your pingo to the cinema, you know, there could be a tornado that goes into the road and causes you to not get there on time. So there's always these unforeseen, you know, circumstances. But for the most part, we, we optimize best on the data that we have. For cancellations, um, all a cancellation does is remove the request from the batch. So there's a batch request we're optimizing for. And by canceling, you just remove that request from that batch. And so you don't get solved for. Do you, do you have to, like, reinitialize your optimization? Um, no. So we, since we're doing it at that 30 second interval, it'll just get fixed the next 30 seconds. I think we, we do, we do like short circuit it a little bit where we, um, we will, um, locally repair the schedule for that vehicle in particular. And then we'll update that schedule so that that schedule, uh, in the, in the drive wrap, it's immediately evident to the driver that somebody canceled. This is really, this is very fascinating. I kind of want to take a step back and ask you like from a personal point of view, you could have done a lot of different things. What sort of led you to, to wanting to solve this type of problem? Yeah, um, I like infrastructure a lot. I like public transportation. I guess there's, there's two, two main reasons. There's like my own enjoyment for it, but then also um, I felt that there was very much a burden on my co-founder and I that we had like this nugget of like, you know, knowledge that other people didn't have. And I felt like it would be, it would be like almost inappropriate for us to not try to make it into something because it was, there's like so much value to be had 
in 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 these on-demand flexible modes of transportation and and really there's like a technology gap um that's why i don't, I don't know where, where you're based but it's probably why you're not seeing you're not taking an on-demand public transportation bus anywhere right now um it's, there's a there's a there's a gap in product um and there's a gap in technology and and both of those gaps are are, are like we're closing um and the other side is um, I, I'm just I'm really fascinated by problems that are easy to grasp but hard to solve. Like you and I can can hear sit here and have a very in depth discussion about you know the effectiveness of on demand public transportation and what you think it could what do you, what do you think it could do? Um, and it's incredible because it's also very hard to solve that problem. And so it means that you can affect so much people who really understand what's going on. Right. And, and and you can do it with technology that has to be cutting edge. Well, we're, um, we're, we're coming up on the end, but I just wanted to ask what you sort of see as the next year or two for the routing company or for you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I see us um, adding a lot of features to uh, to accommodate uh, specific uh, public transportation needs. So two big ones, one of them being this transit connect feature I mentioned where you're able to um, to indicate, you know, which train you're trying to make. And then the system is able to optimize for you and the rest of the people in the system for you to get to that train on time. So that's a really big feature that we're, we're working on right now. Um, and I think it's pretty indicative of the, you know, features that we're going to be adding in, in, in the future to really take this from, you know, something that looks, you know, like Uber in terms of ride sharing and turn it to something distinctly transit. Um, and another feature we're working on is um, event pooling. So when we have a lot of people that are booking at once, uh, how are we able to, uh, to, I guess, consolidate the book, like all the bookings that are in one similar location into one booking? And how do we use that to improve you know, the servicing of, the, of, of these folks. So imagine a bunch of people are getting picked up in a park, um, in the same park. Well, it makes sense for them to all go to the same known location for them to get picked up. And that really is going to uh, significantly improve um, the service time. So how long vehicles are idling around servicing a passenger. Uh, and, you know, that has, you know, knock on effects of the efficiency of the system. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. And that's all for today. If you enjoyed this week's episode, check out our previous episodes at robohop.org forward slash podcast or wherever you usually get your podcasts from. And if you have feedback, episode ideas, or might be interested in joining our Robohop podcast family, we're always happy to hear from our listeners. So just email our podcast lead at abate.de.mey at robohop.org. Our next episode will air in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye. Public Transit with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics.